So, uh, well, once more, um, hello for the second part of our Estonian event tonight. Um, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm still moved by the by the movie um, because maybe to say one one or two sentences about it. In this foundation, we usually speak about activism in the sense of what are the strategies and what is, let's say, the vision of activism and how do we connect activists. But we don't speak a lot about, let's say, the psychology and and what happens to in the private life of somebody who is an activist and what activism does to the activist and to his to his private situation. And I thought that was one of the things personally that moved me now the most in the in the movie we just saw, to show this this part, yeah, somebody like being there for the world but kind of forgetting about oneself, which is okay, which is my my personal view of course. And I'm very curious. We are all curious when we will we'll have the round about you know your opinions and and your view of the movie. Um, maybe though we start out with our. Uh, 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 little more input we have planned. Uh, first of all, for those maybe who came later in the movie, I introduce shortly who's, uh, who's sitting here with us, and I go from left to right, maybe. Right over there is uh, Regina Villasan um, and T. Le Peck, and both of them are, let's say, two motors of Linna Labor EE, which means translated Estonian Urban Lab, this exists for some years now, and uh, the Estonian Urban Lab is active with publications, with projects, with conferences. So they're really the ones who, who work uh, in Tallinn on, on several tracks on, on this issue, and not only in Tallinn, but also in connection with, I think, urban strategies in post-socialist cities. There are also connections from Tallinn to other Baltic states and to other states in, in Eastern Europe. And I know that Regina has attended, for example, one month ago, another conference here in Berlin. So I think the, so. those ideas from the Balticum are really kind of, you know, swapping over here. Who's reading the papers uh, will see that just in Der Spiegel on the 15th uh, of this month, there was a really big article on Spiegel Online in regard to Kalamaya, which is another very specific uh, uh, part of the inner city in Tallinn, in between gentrification, new new business, and and well, you could maybe say even something like the Neukölln of of uh, Tallinn. Uh, as well, I read about uh, Usmalm in Berliner Zeitung uh, and on many many blogs of younger people who moved to Tallinn and and just get acquainted with the scene there. So basically, I'd love to give the floor first for. Um, uh, you know, a presentation about the activities of the Urban Lab to Regina and Taylor, please. Yeah, it's on. Okay, uh, is it on? Yes. I can't really understand. Uh, okay, thank you, Christian, for the for the introduction. Uh, we do also call ourselves activists, but but we even prefer the word citivists. Uh, meaning that we do in, do deal with a city, uh, and sorry, mm -hmm. can you see the slides? <laughs> Better. Uh, okay. We decided to stand because um, to be more active. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a long evening. It has been a long evening, and actually, it's ten o'clock for us as Estonia. So it's a bit of an experiment on being active. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as said, Lina Labor is an NGO dealing with urban issues, uh, a group of experts we, we consider ourselves. And um, well, we were uh, created in 2006 already by a few students of urban geography back then. Uh, but uh, well, in 2006, the institution was something completely different than it is today. We are going to talk a little bit about that afterwards, but before that, actually, we'd like to give you the most broad overview of the historical legacy in Estonia about you know, dealing with activism. 
So, well, you might know that uh, gaining of re-independence in 91, maybe we step a bit further even, yeah, so that a few of our audience can see us. Well, uh, there were years of really massive, unprecedented and very, very emotional uh, actions by people, protests, demonstrations, uh, uh, singing festivals, and one example of those actions being the Baltic chain, where two million people sta stood in one line from Estonia to Lithuania, or well, Lithuania to Estonia. Uh, but what happened afterwards, after 91, was that we really forget, forgot about all this. Um, the 90s, and it's still going on, it's the time of survival in a highly individualist and neoliberal society. And, well, there are a few voices which are calling this time where radical materialism is the religion of Estonians. Uh, but there's something that you also saw in the movie, 2006. There was a bit of fresh air in all this survival. Uh, the Uusmaalm community, they organized this sort of Occupy of the Freedom Square. And I think that inspired quite a few people back then. It was sort of proto-activism of Estonia, maybe. Um, but then what, what followed was that, uh, I, I think it even made the news here, 2007, the big riots, well, riots, they started as protests of the Russian minority against the removal of one monument that was closely connected with their identity. And during the night it just evolved into vandalism and hooliganism. And I'm afraid that this event really kind of strengthened the opinion of Estonians that protest leads to hooliganism. Therefore, bad, you know, we, that's not our style. We don't do that. Uh, but then, you know, five years have passed, and in the beginning of this year, the ACTA, and it's really funny that, um, well, the crisis, it also hit Estonia quite badly, and, um, and thousands of people were made redundant, and the salaries dropped, dropped like 20, 30 percent, and quite a few people were evict evicted from homes, and we didn't come to the streets. There were, okay, yeah, discussions in media, but that's it really. But try to restrict what somebody can do on, online, and hey, you know, they are on the streets with minus 20 degrees in February. And, uh, and seeing that uh, now new protests are happening, just like something on Saturday, one can really say that maybe it's a beginning of a new tradition. At least there's the, the feeling that we are getting much more active publicly now. Uh, and how does uh, yeah, Lina Labor kick in in all this? Well, in 2006, we, we really believed in sort of uh, guerrilla uh, activism. And you see that uh, quite hideous monument that was erected in 2009, the, the freedom the right monument. Hand side. Yes, <laughs> the original, uh, the real one on the right hand side. Uh, what we did, we did a one to eight model of it on the same location before it was built uh, to show the mere size of the thing and also the complete wrongness of the whole concept. Uh, it didn't get any attention back then. So, therefore, we started to settle ourselves in the society as a group of experts and decided to leave all this uh, guerrilla art behind. Well, we still use artistic methods time to time, but, um, but now we are, we are working on, on four lines of thought and... Uh, I'm not going to describe them, as today's topic is really the first one, social innovation. And uh, actually, social innovation is an important concept because uh, that's the definition we, we really prefer to use instead of activism. Just because, firstly, the word activism, it doesn't have a good connotation in Estonia, really. 
it's um, something of a past of the Soviet time and, and so on. And also thinking about activism, then, okay, it's a, it's a deed, it's also a mentality, but isn't social innovation really the thing that kind of drives change? Um, and, the, and the goal really being systemic change, meaning that, um, that the way things are done and the way processes go is, is different and it's in re, uh, uh, constant kind of redefinition process. But here I give the floor to Taylor. Mm -hmm. And now more precisely to what we think is very characteristic to Tallinn uh, concerning social innovation. And um, we're not going to talk about the, the things happening in every other city, uh, graffiti or stuff like that. But we think that these um, neighborhood associations, like you saw in the movie, The New World, they are very characteristic because they have become the social innovators. They are driving the change. They are becoming more and more competent and also raising the awareness of the whole society, let's say so. So there are, after the creation of the New World Society, uh, a lot of new neighborhood associations uh, emerged. And at the moment, there are around 13 active ones. There are more in Tallinn, but these are the most active ones. The majority is uh, within the center of Tallinn, around the new, uh, sorry, the old town, let's say. But there are also some communities um, far away, like this Kakume. This is a new suburb built during the construction boom and some old garden city type um, neighborhoods like Pirita or Nume. So the, the structure of these neighborhoods is very different. Around the old town, there are mostly these wooden districts, uh, protected districts, like the New World. And what is very common to all of them is that they are institutionalized. They... Uh, they operate as NGOs because there is no other way. You are not taken seriously if you are not an institution um, in, the, in the eyes of the local government or the ministries. And so the context is somehow different in different um, neighborhoods, but the problems are quite much the same because, or due to our mm, corrupt city government, old fashioned city government. Mm. what we heard today is quite the same in here in Berlin it was good to hear that <laughs> so but I'm going to show you just a few slides about uh, what these neighborhood associations represent or why they are the social innovation, innovators and uh, what is very common to all of them so first they they take uh, they work on the identity of places they uh, invigorate and um, reclaim the public space, so to say. This is in the very center of Tallinn, in Kalamaya, actually. The Spiegel article was about that. And uh, there's a natural beach, but nothing has been done about it because it's a private property. The seaside is privatized, so the city is incapable of uh, directing the change or the de development there. And, of course, local people are very concerned about the sea, seaside being public also in the future. So there is a beach party that we did and uh, some furniture we put up. And on the smaller photo, um, we put up a temporary sauna. And like, I'm under police investigation now because we didn't have a real permit for it. Yeah, let's hope she won't get fined. <laughs> it was actually very funny. <laughs> And the sauna party was a huge success and it raised the question that, okay, maybe there should be a public sauna. So another point uh, that the neighborhood associations are dealing with, or a big problem, is uh, protecting the rights of the minority in the very car center urban development. And this is a baby pram parade that I organized in Kalamaya again. Um, so we had the whole street for us, and this is just one example. Of course, there are bike enthusiasts and uh, other things going on. But also the neighborhood associations are already 
um, working with um, street plans. They they do these engineer plans almost by themselves already, or they give a lot of suggestions how to make it more a shared space or how to make it more um, friendly for pedestrians, for bikers, for other movers. Then uh, they really work on, uh, this is connected to reclaiming the public space and, and uh, like working with the identity, um, so branding places. On the left-hand side, this is our president, Thomas Hendrik Gilves, and he's visiting a neighborhood association at the very far end of the northern Tallinn. This is a, like ghetto at the moment, but it's assumed that it will uh, start gentrifying in a near future. So the president visits these places, these pays attention to these active people, and therefore these places get more attention, and and the people behind these communities, they it's easier for them to achieve something through that attention, like as you easier and also sometimes not easier as you saw from the movie. Uh, then these associations very much concentrate on living locally and um, trying to develop different local economy models, let's say so. These street festivals and, and local fairs and uh, street markets, pop-up uh, cafes, they are very much part of this um, understanding how to, how to live uh, locally, how to know your neighbor, how to eat what is produced um, in the close proximity of your home. And uh, what is most important, I think, is these uh, associations. They are trying to define the local democracy or the collaborative democracy, trying to convince the city government and um, to collaborate, to negotiate, to uh, consider their voice. It's it's very difficult at the moment, but um, since there is, um, oh, I, I think it should be mutual this uh, collaboration. But at the moment, it's like uh, running against the wall all the time, and uh, the results are really slowly appearing. Uh, but the spatial planning, the detailed plans, master plans, this is a very hot topic for every neighborhood association and, and it's connected to that they are becoming more and more competent. Uh, the spatial planning, to read a detailed plan is uh, huge work and not many people can do it. But um, these people, uh, they have learned it because they, they understand that these detailed plans are like creating the future urban space and are affecting the future very much, the future um, living environment. So they, they want to say a word in these things. And connected to that, that, the, that there is no wider uh, future vision of Tallinn or, and uh, let's say that the city departments are all the time referring that, okay, with this topic or with this problem, you go to the other department and, and from that department, you, they are directed to another department. So like nobody is taking responsibility. The neighborhood associations, um, they are going to work on this big picture on their own, not on their own collaboratively with the city government, but they will start it from the grassroots level. And uh, I'm happy to announce that Linda Labor will coordinate this uh, vision creating process and it's uh, at the very beginning but we are planning to uh, compile this kind of community friendly Tallinn vision it's also branding the city in that way let's see how it works it's uh, very much connected to local elections in uh, next October we are thinking about um, organizing a fake election campaign to just to communicate these um, visions of local communities. Yeah. Um, and as I know that next presentation will be about the capital of culture, <laughs> I make a short introduction <laughs> to that topic as well, but it's connected to neighborhoods anyway. Uh, so last year, Tallinn was the European capital of culture. And the, the biggest achievement, I think, 
was the kilometer of culture. On the left hand side you see former railway track and on the right hand side you see how it looks now. It's just a pedestrian road, let's say so. It's very narrow, very simple. It's 2.2 kilometers long, so it's not one kilometer. And in reality, there is no culture. There's just some sports and some walking and some babies. <laughs> and the 2.2 <laughs> kilometers. Um, but what is important is that it uh, it's very close to the seaside. And it opened the seaside because the seaside at the moment in the center of Tallinn is... Um, you can call it wasteland, it's waiting for developments. It's all privatized, and uh, in Soviet time, there was no access to the seaside due to military and um, industrial uh, oh, areas. And, and this uh, path, it has opened the seaside a lot, and now every neighborhood is dreaming of its own culture kilometer because this is a car-free zone, and you can just feel happy there. Let's say so. I think that's all from us. Thank you very much. Regina and Taylor, merci. Maybe if I can follow up with one question. Um, please take a seat first, sorry. Um, in, in the movie, Kaku says uh, once, so we stopped to do or we kind of think to stop to do spontaneous work because we feel now that we are, you know, have accepted money from the city and by, 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 by putting a project forward, we also feel obliged somehow to, to, to cooperate. You mentioned uh, now that, let's say, activism as a word even is a little bit somewhat not negatively connotated but has definitely a different connotation than here, as I understand properly. In Tallinn, at least. So, uh, how, how do you, having described your work, would you would you say, let's say, the trend is going towards more cooperation or more resistance with you and with the neighborhood movements? I think both. It works uh, both sides. Uh, from one hand, neighborhoods in spatial planning, especially, they are going to court with the plans mm -hmm. that uh, don't consider any suggestions or any arguments or opinions um, from the local people. But um, from the other hand, um, yeah, there is some change going on already because uh, the city government is realizing that, okay, we cannot continue like that. We need some kind of new model, but nobody knows what is the new model or what could it be. So I think we are slowly working on it. Mm -hmm. There seems to be that there are different stages Activism always has started as a form of NIMBY, you know, hey, what's going on, you know, I don't like it. Then it becomes, hey, I don't like what's going on in my city. Then the third stage is that they try to start collaboration with the officials. And now the fourth stage, which seems to be going on at the moment, is that they get tired of trying to collaborate with a city. As you said, it is really running against the wall and... Um, so I call it torture technique, this <laughs> participation. <laughs> uh, that's, excuse me to, to, to go in there because participation seems is now such a big word in Germany again, yeah, in the sense of how to organize procedures of participation, an issue we spoke about today on our whole trip and almost every, every place we went to. So, so, so you also have, a, let's say, a, a, there's a critical point in your view at that moment in Tallinn. But why? Because it's too much participation or the wrong participation? What's your view of this? Yeah, it's, let's say it simply, it's the wrong participation. It's not about the issue, but it's about if we, uh, if the participation is done legally, like the letters are sent out, the public discussions are being organized. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, speaking, uh, please, Jan, of course. I just... Uh, met uh, bicycle activists uh, in, in Tallinn and uh, they, they said that they are quite tired uh, to ask uh, permission for the events and they would like to <laughs> to go uh, with this like guerrilla style much more and it, it so much depends what kind of are those officials. And, yep. Like Uzma is compiling their own 
master plan, really, on their own, because they just got tired of talking with the city about it. And I hope that the next stage is, again, collaboration in a, some new form, but at the moment it's tire, tiredness. It's yeah, somewhat apathic, yeah. There was also a little feeling I got when I was there last time. Um, maybe to, to, to go to the next step you mentioned in the f uh, final stage of your presentation, the Kulturi Perlin, the culture city of Europe. And I think, um, which was for my feeling, dealing with this idea of inclusion, yes, of, of trying to include uh, uh, a lot of ideas also from, from the public, at least this was the idea. So we are lucky enough tonight to have uh, somebody here like Mikko Fritze over here. Uh, Mikko's story with Estonia is uh, somewhat, you know, more deeply rooted than like, let's say, as, how would you say, a Söldner Einsatz as, as uh, you know, leader of the culture city. Mikko has uh, for many years led the Goethe Institute in, in Tallinn and uh, was then in a concourse named uh, the leader of the Culture City 2011 and um, now at the Goethe Institute in Helsinki again. Um, Mikko, what would be really interesting is if you give us a, a little bit input on how this idea development worked. Was it a complete, like a, a top-down process? Because I think it's interesting thinking about inclusion. Where is it coming from? Is it a demand or is it something that's being given? Or in the end, is it a process from both sides? So since I think the, a good part of the Kultur Perlin, at least as an idea, was about inclusion, how did that develop? Where did it start from and where did it go to in the end? Okay, yes. Um, guten Abend. Um, Yeah, interesting to talk about that, having all these Tallinn people here sitting around. And, and now I can't... Very often I talk about the cultural capital and there's nobody who can really say, is it true or not? So now it's, the diff no, it's different. Um, yeah, I kind of... Um, in a way, you're, I, I became the boss of the cultural capital because I speak Estonian as a foreigner. That was the main reason. And maybe because I have lived there for a few years and people kind of like me and they like if in a small country there's a German guy who speaks Estonian. That was enough to be the boss of a cultural capital. So I really didn't know how to do that. I mean, it was really like... Um, I don't. I didn't. I have never done something big like that. And I guess there are like two possibilities: somebody who acts as a, as a curator, who kind of knows what's good for the city, and maybe he even does know what is good for the city, but he must be a good curator and still have a good feeling for the people and for how to do the things. Or uh, you kind of try to get the ideas out of the city, out of all the creative people. But I don't refer only to artists and everybody who wants to do something in his city. And that was, in my eyes, the definitely tougher way to do it but the 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 more honest way closer to me and i think the only right way for Tallinn. and it's not new york it's not paris it's not berlin it's a rather small town so we took the risk to kind of approach the people and uh, the first of course you talk about it you tell the people and then nothing happens of course but anyway we made a campaign and the campaign was called the uh the cultural capital has got your face and it looked a little bit like um <laughs> the face looked a little bit like the silence of the lambs this is the mask of this guy this horrible mister whatever and uh, and and of course it's hard to move estonians and it took quite a while but still we we kind of could and we tried to really give this impression to to tell people it's not a party for tourists and officials it's your thing and and kind of got people moving and uh had several hundreds of ideas and out of these ideas we wanted to make the projects But as well, which I think is important, referring to what you told about those pictures and my feeling that we might have even changed something in Tallinn would be great, we kind of tried to, to get out an idea for the whole project as well. When I came there, there has been, of course, they had to, to get the title from Europe, they have to kind of present some ideas, and they, ha they had a, a kind of idea, of a, a slogan for, for Tallinn, which is called, was called um, An Everlasting Fairy Tale. And, uh, wow... 
And uh, it's, yeah, it's like, you know, like the most cultural town in the north or the pearl of the eastern sea. So we, we really hope through this open call to get some, some points which we could refer to and have a general idea or a concept for, for the cultural capital, at least a good slogan. And, and then you have to really imagine, I don't have you ever been in a cultural capital, especially if it's small, it really releases a lot of energy. Kind of everybody wants to take part in it. The taxi drivers, the hotel people, the creatives, you know, even if they oppose, they kind of give energy into it. And it was always my vision, if you can canalize a little bit of this energy, get it gathered together, and maybe you could even, it could lead into to a small change in the city, to a few changes in cultural life and stuff like that. So, and, and really, in, out of these ideas we got, there was this theme of the sea very often it was it was we had i think we had like between 500 and 600 in the beginning ideas and and at least it was visible that people kind of had this problem that Tallinn, being such a beautiful place being so close to the water actually had no real re- relationship to the water so now it's maybe time for my picture as well yeah it's it's even it's even worse the picture than what you see now so I mean, if you have ever been to Tallinn, it's it's really beautiful. It's a pearl. It's a wonderful old town, and you have all these nice. Oh, that was too tough. It's too too hard to take. Uh, and you saw all these wooden districts, which are beautiful as well, and a really nice town. But the beaches or the, the the places to the seashore, they look like this. And this is like two minutes from downtown. And that's as well the the walk. You walked through all that mess and shit if you come as a Finnish tourist to Tallinn, and this has been on like that for years. There are several reasons. You mentioned one that's been in Soviet times. There was no contact to the sea. I think even historically, Tallinn has rather been a place which is protecting itself against the sea and against hostile people. But still, we live in other days, and the time can change, and it would be really nice maybe to get a contact, and it would be absolutely great for the people to, that live there and for tourists and food for tourism in general. So we kind of had the idea, we, we, we make our slogan, to, to kind of open up Tallinn to the sea, to get it closer to the sea. And, and of course, you can't make all your program in the beach and you can't put every program like you can put in there about something about the sea. But having it as a motto, it kind of, it kind of worked. And, and I'm really I kind, of, I'm kind of flattered if I see that uh, there's this cultural kilometer which actually really has as well a really strong... Um, but that it happened has our our office has to do with that a lot and and then they built you didn't talk about it but they built the the state built a um, maritime museum which is really fantastic and probably giving impulses to a region positive ones in a way and it would have never come without this motto because the state didn't want to finance the city because they quarreled with the mayor and stuff like that so they made just their own project there and there was this museum which kind of succeeded in a way so Maybe that's for the beginning enough. But maybe to be a little bit more specific, that's possible uh, about the the in- inclusion technique. Means, if I remember rightly, in the beginning you put out the open call, but what happened then? Because you know now, open call is a big thing about conferences here and so on and so on. You know, input of the of the of the ones who usually are being just being put on so what was your impression that a lot of the ideas that were being put in or were they being put in and if so um did did they blossom later or what what was your impression on this okay i mean the, the many many of the ideas we realized or the the I, I didn't anymore, but that were realized in the cultural capital came through this open call, and it was quite a long time that people could uh, bring in ideas um, and then of course there are some cultural players who won't bring in their ideas they are you have to go there and ask them to bring them in so of course we moved ourselves as well and talked to a lot of people and stuff like that but mainly mainly the program consisted out of the, the, the of the results of the open call except of course the big players we approached ourselves but some of them were not so I mean they could as well come in and want to take part in it and then we formed a kind of a Uh, a, a culture, a board, a board f- that which is not. I was actually by by the status of this organization I was leading. I was the head of this board as well. But the board was consisting of people that were really kind of could say you could say independent. They're really out of out of our our team, and they were really representing a large kind of large kind of range of yeah. Uh, tr- trustable Estonian intellectuals or artists, I guess. Am I right? 
You remember? Like Rain Road and all this people's stuff. So we kind of, and that was in a way correct, and we, we didn't take the decisions ourselves, so we really never got into this curator role. And uh, people trusted them, and or rather, as well, I think this this was it. I mean, we made we tried to get close to the people to make them really believe that their ideas could be realized in the cultural capital. And then we tried to, to kind of... Um, convince them or give them the guarantee that they are they these these ideas are at least checked and and approved or not approved by people they could trust it was of course not the complete transparency we we didn't you know our discussions and stuff like that were not open but actually which was a surprise because people say always it's always you have the, it's the management of disappointment as part of the cultural capital process we actually there were not too many quarrels about this this idea there were of course but it was not a big issue that, that we kind of select the wrong things or that it's all like unfair or whatever or, or was there I don't know. I, 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 I didn't get to me, though. Of course, there were single things, and we did made mistakes as well. But maybe, okay, to, 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 to ask in the round uh, one more question about the culture capital. Um, now, I read that on in a marketing point of view, yes, there were in 2011 40 or 50% more tourists coming. Let's say, which was, as I understand, uh, uh, properly being being seen as, okay, something that the culturally and kind of reached as one goal. But now the Estonians on the panel, would, would you say that there's more, there was more to it now in, in the in the middle long run besides the besides the rise of, you know, let's say culture repair as a marketing tool? Was was there more to it? Is there something that, that's still being felt in the city now? Or is is was it a nice year that's over? If you like, Jan, you know, I just... Mm-hmm. Okay, the guys are shy. Um, <laughs> I think our program of the Capital of Culture, it really managed to involve the locals in that way that, as I understood, the budget was cut uh, during the process of... Uh, so at first it was like three times bigger than at the end. Uh, and therefore, a lot of um, small amount of money was given to, let's say, smaller players. And uh, the culture, so to say, was very visible in the urban space, and especially around the seaside in the center. There was this urban installations festival organized by a few curators. And they. what was really great was that they took all this bureaucracy negotiations with the private owners of the land, with the city government, with everything. And uh, this was a good model. I think it was also the model for the whole culture capital year. But um, in that respect, and the open call was also for locals or for Tallinners that have had lived there for at least five years. So um, to realize their ideas in the public space and this beach party and beach installation was one uh, of them. Uh, so I think uh, compared to Turku, which was the second capital of culture at the same time. In Finland. Yeah, in Finland. Uh, what I heard, I didn't visit it, unfortunately, but I heard from my Finnish friends that uh, compared to Turku, Tal- in Tallinn, it was really visible that there was something going on, something special or like you could feel it on every step and you could see it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you succeeded very well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Regina, of course. Yeah, I'll just add from a personal point of view that I think, well, this whole culture capital thing, it, may, it made me believe more in temporary installations. Mm. Well, the Kulturi Kilometer being a temporary thing, there's going to be a car road soon, and, and other installations along the seaside uh, that were caused by this temporary installation called the Kulturi capital thing itself, you know, temporary thing, then I saw that they do have an influence, spatial, mental, maybe even historical, you know, that it does go on. So so temporary was also a verb we, we spoke a lot about today. And I think when we move uh, to, to Matthew in a minute, we will speak about this because this is a very Berlin thing, of course, the temporary use, yes, which we find in many of the projects uh, uh, we spoke about uh, today. But maybe first now to move a little bit to the movie and just picking up of, of 
what you just said, the relationship between government and activists or just community. Yes, I think, you know, Jan and Jak, it was, it was a part of the movie in the sense, you know, you made decisions on what in the documentary, documentary you would put the, the finger on. And it seemed to me next to this big issue of what happens to the activists being an activist, it seemed also that the relationship between government, police, administration and the activist and how to go about this, yes, was a, was a big, uh, was a big uh, issue and a big part in the movie. Just, you know, for me, remembering the first scene when, when uh, the activists speak to the, the local government, <clears throat> the lady and, and the guy that you had the feeling you caught some moment of like, wanting to understand but not really coming together. So was that something in the research and also while you were shooting through four years, yes, you were really looking for as moments because also you chose the beginning of the movie, like this, let's say, little confrontation between uh, the late lady deputy mayor and, and, and Erko, yes. So what, what role did that play for you to shed light on in the, in the movie? Maybe this uh, thinking about how this uh, the relationship between this the government and uh, this like a community is changed during this time. I remember that uh, six five years ago when they uh, wanted to make uh, this the first uh, street the festival. Then uh, when they said to this uh, the government officials that uh, they would like to clean this area without any car in these days, uh, then this, uh, the normal reaction was that, oh, it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely nonsense. It's unbelievable that you, you need uh, this set. Uh, it's not possible. But now, after now, this year was uh, the sixth uh, of uh, the street festival already. And now it's quite normal. It's very normal that... Uh, in these days, at the beginning of every September, the, <laughs> the area is uh, only for this uh, pedestrian area, or for open for the for the people. But uh, yes, the the confrontation, uh, <laughs> the, the the woman mm-hmm. and this uh, the uh, Erko yep, and yeah. the the group is still at the, even. Um, they moved now another new house. Maybe this is uh, quite new. All you mean this, how, yeah. it, how it went on? Yeah. yeah. At, uh, that although this, uh, the end of the movie was so like sad or depressed, uh, uh, they now found it a new place. It's uh, quite close from this, maybe 20, 20 meters from this uh there is another <laughs> another wooden house. Closer to uh, Evie. Yeah. Yeah. And Evie still uh, Evie's still looks, there. Looks, then looks through the window. No signs and, uh, on the roof. Okay. And asks the po- police. Uh, but yeah, now it's a uh, totally new new place. It's a cafeteria and library two in one, in a one uh, basement. And uh, Erko is... Uh, like a, like a king in this very small <laughs> small place, uh, and this is the, the place is absolutely illegal. They don't have a permission to to keep the cafeteria there. There was uh, before the library was parallelly with this uh, the community house time, but now it's uh, and uh, the best coffee in Tallinn is uh, there. Uh, Erko. <laughs> Erko found uh, one old coffee machine in uh, the Helsinki, some somewhere in street, and bring it. <laughs> no, he, he doesn't still. Well, yeah, b- I, maybe yeah, 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 yeah. I would like to please. add uh, one thing. Um, um, the um, the good thing that um, actually helped our uh, new world guys was um, the uh, the good media response. Mm-hmm. Basically, uh, they managed to attract the media. Estonian media just loved them. The media just fell in love uh, with our uh, protagonists. Um, so uh, everything they did, 
<laughs> with like 10 cameras and journalists because uh, basically nothing like that uh, had ever happened in in Thailand before, so uh, media just loved them, and probably this like media good media attention uh, made the city government to like take them seriously. Pressure, yeah. Media, pre actually, it was like I'm not sure if to it, be uh, the civil society or all. Uh, this is very popular, and uh, all these uh, the officials like uh, feel that uh, there is uh, it's. Uh, good idea to deal with uh, such kind of groups. But uh, I remember another uh, little story that Kaku, this the girl leader, uh, told that uh, it was normally when if you have a camera in the room and this, the, the officials are very polite. But one time Kaku remembered that uh, when he was alone, she was alone with uh, the official mm -hmm. and uh, there was some another permission that she need uh, in this time, and then uh, she began uh, uh, crying. Just the tears are dropping from the eyes, and uh, later she asked, that, uh, "Should I every time have to to start to, to crying that uh, I, I, <laughs> I got something? this uh, yeah. permission to make uh, something on the street, either crying or camera?" No, no, it's big, uh, because camera helped uh, uh, in many occasions uh, uh, get uh, some permissions so, uh, or get uh, to push through some things. But yeah, I'm very curious. Now we see the the, the let's say the, the life and kismet of, of of this group you found there and and you 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 uh, you filmed. But how, how was your position in the sense you are doing this for four years? And you're following a group that's losing faith once in a while, then, you know, they rise up again, yes. But I could imagine to produce through four years a documentary fully and post-produce it and so on, bring it in and so on. Did, did you lose a face as film activists while you were shooting? But uh, as a film activist, uh, what do you mean? Well, well uh, you know, as somebody who's interested in this activist, uh, 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 let's say, issue, yeah, because there, there might be topics which might lead earlier to some materialistic success. So I have the feeling that you chose a topic that just, like, deeply interested you, yeah. But I could also see, and that would, in, would interest me very much, if you work for four years on it, were there also times when you were producing and doing this that you felt, is there something coming out of this project or... The, the face was your faith in the project was was carrying through till the mm. end because maybe to add this was the movie of the year 2011 in Estonia uh, by but you know this prize is given by the Estonian film critics and has been in the film fest Hamburg and in man, many other festivals so so we speak about the quite very successful documentary but after some years it, it seems that uh, this like um, the psychological line is much more interesting that this is uh, because uh, in the beginning it was very interesting that there is uh, some people who really came out to the street because it's not uh, so normal in Estonia because Estonians are uh, quite shy. <laughs> and But uh, this, the, the two characters uh, did so many like actions. Uh, but uh, for me it, it makes much more universal this the story which has... Uh, more levels than only this activistic level that all this the love story and and even I, I compared my own private life <laughs> during this uh, huh. observing period yeah. that I have uh, made through all this uh, crisis in my own life and and look at their crisis and I sometimes think that this is like uh, Zen uh, Buddhistic practice uh, it's uh, <laughs> how to how it uh, the film, the process it, it, it changed your own uh, thinking to the world at how it's uh, like um, fresh eyes is uh, to tail problem and uh, I can like zoom out and and see inside my own soul at how it how it, it works. Yeah, but uh, speaking of these four, actually five years of production of this film. Um, Probably, um, you know, I was not that 
uh, unpatient. Uh, Estonia Film Foundation, they were really unpatient because they, okay. uh, because they are bureaucrats and they Why? really needed, uh, they needed uh, this like final, final financial report. Oh, hey guys, okay. where's the final report? Uh, we have been waiting for it like, for the last two years. But uh, I, I always oh, explain okay. them that, listen, this film needs four years. We cannot uh, finish it because uh, uh, we need more time because uh, we still uh, we are still following our characters. That's what I mean. It, not the, for the post production, but yeah. for for the yeah, yeah. actual. So uh, I was actually uh, mm, punished. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we really needed to finish the film uh, because uh, Estonia Film Foundation, was, you know, kind of blocked all our applications uh, before we. Future, uh, yeah. Future. Yeah, so we needed to finish it, but but then uh, together with uh, the bureaucrats from Estonia Film Foundation, we found one one uh, old agreement that was not signed properly. So so we, we could uh, we could uh, so we, we we managed to find a way how to postpone the screening, or the, the the premiere. So kind of uh, uh, yeah, we needed to be clever in order to you know make it uh, as a long term. Project, but I'm I'm really convinced that uh, that that kind of documentary needs to be a long-term observation on projects. Yeah, uh, please. I just wanted to Hayden. add, we are very thankful to you, Jan and Dirk, that you took this four years because it has uh, made our work so much easier. <laughs> you know, we come here, we show the movie first, and then we talk about the topic. Yeah. And we did it in the conference we organized in. Um, June in Tallinn as well, and to, it's universal, but at the same time, it very much uh, characterizes the civil society of Estonia, all the struggles, the running against the walls, and um, so thank you for making it easier for us. Well, uh, I just uh, <clears throat> one uh, small remark. I just got uh, a text message from Erko. Ah, who's, and, who I might want to add. Yes. we met today. In the uh, subway, subway <laughs> number eight, uh, he called us, and all of a sudden he was standing in front of us with uh, two friends. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. So he will come here. Ah, soon. Okay. <laughs> soon. <laughs> so, Good. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, you know, uh, actually, uh, probably you noticed that my phone was calling all the time. What's him? Yeah, it was okay. Erko, and Erko was asking, uh, "What's up?" <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I. Um, we asked, uh, I, 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 I sent him a text message that uh, we will have vodka soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's coming. But first, okay, now I would like to introduce the sixth man, you know, as we say in the NBA, yeah? the sixth man award, the sixth man in our round, Matthew Griffin, uh, architect and as well uh, one of the, you know, motors and members of this uh, initiative, which we have spoken about before, Stadt Neudenken, rethinking the city, is that proper, or new thinking the city? Well, I think um, new thinking the city would be perhaps um, the literal L translation. Literal translation. But, and yeah. maybe to, to go right into, 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 into the matters, one question I would have is, you know, to give a little idea what this is, but now you have heard all this input about Tallinn. You have seen the movie. And Matthew is one of the people who is involved now in all this discussion about what, you know, the Germans here know as the discussion about the Liegenschaftsfonds and about uh, uh, cultural uh, places in Berlin which are, have temporary use and about all this tema which is really virulent in the city at this moment, um, meaning that we have uh, ground, the city owns publicly, but... It's, it's sold to the highest bidder, and we have, as you know, places from Prinzessengarten, all we saw today, to Katerholzig, two and two and two. So these are the other issues where uh, Matthew and other people here, Jürgen Breiter, for example, who gave us uh, a very nice, was our guide today, through Rota Print and Uferhallen. Um, so first, what do you do with the initiative? And second, hearing all this Tallinn situation, where do you see similarities or differences to the Berlin situation? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that was a great movie. Um, I really loved it. Thanks for making it. And uh, I found it really inspiring. 
And um, and thanks also for inviting me here. I'm the only person on, on this level who hasn't been to Tallinn, I think. Um, but I come from Canada, where it's really cold. We have very, very much snow in the winters, or we used to when I lived there. So I think I can relate. And um, I also like the way that you structured the film into winters, because I, I think that way too. And uh, how do we get through the next winter is a pretty critical question for any kind of initiative or uh, or something like that. And so... I was I was watching this film and thinking, oh, you know, this is a fantastic human story. You know, it's got all the characteristics of of any you know great literature. There's a a conflict and a struggle and a mission, and uh, and there's also a business plan. But and and I thought that this this um, this business plan aspect it was kind of an interesting thing, um, in particular because it, it it seems to be you guys had to face the same kind of problem making the film. Um, and so, anyways, uh, I, I, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, Initiative Stadt Neudenken. I did bring a few slides with me. Um, I don't know if they're on here. Oops. Okay, so I'm just going to be really quick about this. It's a bit of a long story. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the whole debate but Initiative Stadt Neudenken has, uh, has, has the goal to transform the way Berlin treats its publicly owned property. It's a pretty clear goal. We want to change the way it works. And it started <clears throat> this, uh, well, about a year ago when one of the companies that uh, is owned 100% by the city decided to put a piece of... or. Four, five pieces of property on the market where there had been a, a, a long, two-year-long public participative process that was organized by local activists to try and figure out what to do with this site. So basically, the government had sort of stopped, or, or the people who were, who were selling the land had, had decided to act against the interests of the public in the form of this public process. And so the initiative started... <clears throat> to try and stop not just this sale, but all the other sales. And you have to sort of, sort of see this in the context of Berlin. I've been here for 20 years, and Berlin has been a fascinating place for me because it lives so much in, in these kind of empty gap kind of situations which are all over the place or were all over the place and are now disappearing. And there are many of the you know, really important cultural things that happened in Berlin sort of developed out of this nothing, out of this emptiness, that's uh, now disappearing. And because of all the international interest in Berlin that's suddenly been generated by these kind of initiatives, there's a huge amount of real estate pressure to develop all these last few remaining gaps as quickly as possible. And we uh, think that it should be done differently. We think that the sale or use of land shouldn't be driven by maximum price, but by the best concept, the best use. And we're trying to get uh, the city to stop selling its property for the high, at, to the highest bidder and start thinking about how it could be done differently. That's why it's called Stadt Neudenken, because we want to think again. And so this was the, this was the um, sort of first uh, public statement regarding the position of the initiative. This is Jürgen's copy, and he's made some nice sketches on the top. And um, pretty quickly, we had over 500 signatures. And the interesting thing is, is that the Stadt Neudenken is, is more or less a network of networks. It's not really a thing on its own, but it's something kind of much bigger, which is, which is quite interesting. Because the reason for this, I think, is that all these initiatives, which have been sort of active in the city for quite a while, are starting to realize that the, the kind of the, the main resource from which they live namely these empty, unused, derelict spaces, is disappearing. And, and this means that things like the rents and the cost of living are going up, and all of a sudden everybody's starting to realize that, okay, we have to go back to the source and try and rethink what's going on. So then comes the question, okay, yeah, like, how, how do you actually go about doing that? That's a pretty big 
difficult thing to do to try and change the way government, uh, you know, runs these things. So this is, uh, one event, which, uh, which we organized, which is, which was basically a, a workshop trying to bring everybody together to talk about what, uh, what they've done and what they want to do and how they uh, think uh, things should go. And a lot of it's just, just plain, you know, getting everybody to the, to the same page. And interestingly enough, things are slowly starting to change. And this is just one example. This is an exhibition that just opened um, at the beginning of the month about um, the this um, flower market area, which is uh, what's being sold. <clears throat> and and that was the, the same piece of property, the same set of five sites that started the whole uh, initiative. And it's the first time that um, Berlin is uh, has now decided to sell property not just based on the price but also based on the concept. It's kind of interesting because nobody really knows uh, how to do it, but it's sort of one of those things everybody's learning a bit as they go along. And um, I think that there's a lot of hope in this project that it will turn out to be different and um, there's a lot of responsibility that uh, it will uh, be different in the end. And then... Um, yeah, a week and a half ago, we had the first round table in the Berlin Parliament um, discussing how we could change the way these uh, properties are being sold. And <clears throat> that's the end of the, the slideshow. So for us, it, it, it comes down to this, this, this question again, how do you go up against the machine? You know, the bureaucracy is there and it operates in a certain kind of a way. And we, uh, as as whatever, you know, I'm an architect, I sort of have some sort of idea about how these things function. But, you know, a lot of people don't. And, um, and I don't really either, like, you know, the inner workings of the machine. But um, <clears throat> you have to have a huge amount of uh, patience. You know, this has been going on for a bit over a year. That's actually nothing. Like, that's really fast. I mean, um, one of the, I was also involved in, in, in trying to, fight for a better plan for a street and that was like an eight-year process and um so what the film was for i think um this is just the beginning and i think that it's it's been quite encouraging with with this initiative to see how actually um people are starting to change to think change the way they think government seems to be reacting and 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 then basically it's coming back down to this this business plan question again how do you actually structure an initiative so that it can keep going because people are mostly doing it in their free time or in, in our case they're all exclusively doing it in their free time and and we're actually delivering something that is for the public good you know we're sort of trying to change the way uh this city operates for you know the city it's not um it's 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 it's, it's kind of a difficult business when you're trying to actually get money to make the machine of the business work and how can you debate uh, with you know these politicians who are you know backed up by lawyers and backed up by economists and backed up by scientists and you know you're drawing on the goodwill and energy of of a large network but um Basically, if you are, uh, if you need to generate an, uh, a financial circle, you know, you need to get money in from somewhere to pay for the kind of professionalization of something to be able to just negotiate at, at, a, at an even level with with the other side. And and for me, that's sort of one of these essential questions on how 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 do initiatives work? Like, what is the financial model behind them? And a lot of them are based on on just sort of. Other economies, like, you know, if the media comes, then that's a good day and we all have a beer together and stuff. But but in the end, if you want to keep going for a few years and, and you want to actually have an impact, you do have to find a way to generate cash. Um, but I haven't got an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now in regard to what you saw today, is it, it, you like you would, would you say the same melody seems to be played uh no matter where we are in Europe or... Well, I mean, I, I, perhaps no matter where we are in the world, I was just thinking about, well, that's what I sort of meant with the whole, like, story. You know, if, if we're talking about, you know, um, whatever, Homer, the Odyssey, you know, you could probably take elements of, of, of the classical literature and put them into the stories that go behind these things. 
And I think that, uh, you know, also it was interesting to watch the movie with the characters involved, like, you know, like this one guy who's like totally charismatic, completely, you know, in overdrive the whole time. He can focus intensely for a little while and then sort of loses it and, you know, and, 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 and the whole thing is sort of based on his personal energy to a, to a large degree, but all these people supporting him. And, 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 and then, you know, that sort of dissipates because it doesn't generate this energy which will keep the machine going. And so I think that we see that in, in a lot, you know, like um, if you look at WikiLeaks, for instance, you know, that sort of had a similar arc of a very charismatic guy that, you know, everything starts to fall apart after a certain while, you know. Um, so I think that there is this, there's this conflict between these people who have this sort of activist energy and really can focus and want to change and want to do something, but really don't want to have anything to do with this bureaucratic world, this money world. How do I generate a business plan that's going to keep an organization going? And so this is like one of these prime conflicts, which is perhaps at the core of any of these initiatives. Charisma and economy. Yeah. yeah. So maybe since I know it has been quite, you know, we saw the movie and you, you, you listened attentively. Maybe we make one round out there because... I bet there are, you know, in any way, questions to what we, to what, uh, what, what, what everybody spoke about, but also in regard to the movie, and we will just go around. Yeah, Francisca has the microphone. Please. Can you introduce the uh, Stadt Neudenken to Tallinn, to the city of Tallinn? Well, and um, which uh, thought have you for the city of Tallinn, for the Stadt Neudenken? I've never been to Tallinn, so I think I think I would be overstepping my my uh, my horizons to imagine that I might be able to actually tell them anything useful. But I'd love to uh, I'd love to visit <laughs> and. Um, And I think that, uh, you know, that the thing about Stadt Neudenken is because it's a structure of many different initiatives working together, that is a really important thing. And I think, you know, I saw this map of, of all these little neighborhood initiatives and basically what you have to do is get them all pulling in the same direction. Um, and uh, that would be my tip, but maybe that's happening already. Mm. Yeah. Well, you're... You're working with the selling of public land. Uh, the thing with Estonia is that we have sold it already, everything. The city owns yeah, like 10% mm -hmm. of the land and half of that is a lake and the other half are streets. So <laughs> that's it. That's actually pretty similar here. There isn't very much uh, public land left. But, but I agree that uh, more collaboration between these similar um, mission organizations is always welcome and always needed uh, And as well as um, doing things first with the concept and then realizing them. Like, so this is what we can take over from Stadtneuting. I mean, a lot of the strength is, is coming from like what, you know, how much um, striking craft, striking strength rather does, does a, a group have. And the more they're put together, the more power they have. And it's just a question of, of, of aligning things somehow. And that's, that's where, you know, The government machine is very good at maintaining their alignment, whereas a, a bunch of, uh, you know, activists um, doesn't have, you know, that same capacity. So the more that you can do that with communication and technology, the, the more strength you have. Yeah, we have some more questions in the audience. Yeah, whoever would like to start, please. Yes, I would like to know to whom has Salin sold its land to foreign capitalists or to private Estonians. Mm -hmm. For example, if I think of, um, I haven't been to Tallinn for, I, but I think about five years. But then Haryu Tenev. I think it was difficult to develop Haryu Tenev because uh, there were still, well, privateers from before the war who owned property. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mikko, please. I think, I mean, yeah, the Haryutan, I think, is maybe, a, I mean, one of the few good examples, I guess. I don't know if the result is so good, but anyway, as it was owned by by former owners, the city bought this back. And Can then, you explain what it is? Oh, yeah, that's, sorry. It's a, it's the only part of the old town of Tallinn which was hit by a bomb. Boom. 
and uh, and it, uh, it it's actually not a very large area, but large enough and sad, and it was in ruins, and they couldn't do anything there during a lot of time, and then they bought the land back from the owners, as far as I understood, and made a park out of it. Now you can quarrel about the park, but uh, how it looks like, but at least it was kind of in touch. But yeah, but it was rather wild. Yeah, it, because it's ruins, it was anyway beautiful, but now it's, yeah. And the other thing, I'm not, I don't know exactly, but uh, I think they sold the land to everybody who just was uh, willing to buy it. And there are all kinds of, lot, at the end, lots of Estonians, but there's an Italian, Italian investor, a big one. And, and maybe there's a little hope because a lot of this land has not been, const- uh, not been used yet. It's not in construction, and I think the authorities will be kind of very surprised if telling people really start having an opinion and what they start to have and and they really go because of course there are laws as well and there's a european law so they have to present their plans they have to and then if people come up and 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 make it difficult for them to realize they're they're building ideas which till now has not been done so often but in kalamai it has already been done so the people go there and they check it and they protest a little bit so i think there's a little bit of hope let's let's grasp a little bit of hope but you're right i think everything is sold already and everything is planned already. There's, there exists this sort of virtual telling for 100,000 people. It's just the not yet. Plan. <laughs> the Bauer's plan. Yeah, well, I can't see any connections between the people we have seen in that film. They all went by bike, except those two to this official uh, date there in Berlin. And you, uh, the people we saw on your pictures in uh, here Blumgroßmarkt and uh, they all uh, no one of this if they are your uh, supporters they don't look like if anybody has come by bike I hope some came by underground or uh, S-Bahn but most of them in these suits looked as if they came by their own car and I've I been think there and I went there by bike. there are gl- <laughs> oh, oh I see then you are the- there are Gletscherspalten, I don't know the word in English, Gletscherspalten, between these people and those who supported Blum. Well, I, I, I okay, can't... We, we, we take this as an opinion, yeah? <laughs> okay. Or, or would, would you like to... Oh, well, well yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you, you do have to, uh, you know, you have to think about what, what the situation is, and I think that uh, um, what we're talking about is... You, you can't judge a person by what kind of uh, way they get to where they're going. Um, and I think that if you're talking about changing something that's a very broad thing in society, you have to actually involve everybody, whether they drive a car or a bike. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not uh, particularly um, you know, judgmental about, about that sort of thing. But um, I think that uh, also... If you look at, uh, that was an interesting thing to pick up on in the movie because they said, oh, well, when you're 30, you'll have a car and you'll be different. And so there is this kind of idea that once people get a car and turn 30 and have kids or whatever, that they're different people. But the point is is that if you want to change something, it doesn't really matter if you drive a car or a bicycle. It's a question of of your vision and and how you're going to get there. Thank you very much, Matthew. And I think uh, about the bike story though i'd like to 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 ask because there's a point to it yes um remembering myself being in tallinn in like 97 compared to 2006 and then to 11 i thought the amount of bikes on the street has grown massively yes i mean maybe not yet a comparison to berlin but i have the impression miko that also the activities in the uh, kultur in I think they also you also took this as an as an issue, yes. Tallinn Bicycle uh, Week, the Tallinn Bicycle, Bicycle Week. Week, and this uh, uh, organization of uh, Tallinn Rattarikaks that was founded uh, in our offices, and and we had uh, official bikes. We had like Dienstfahrräder in our office, like uh, so. We were really promoting biking, and and uh, uh, mildly said, I'm one of the most popular city bikers, at least in my times in Tallinn, because I was the only one for years, not anymore. Because of, no, but I, it's a, I really like biking, and I think uh, it, it, it's part of every 
town and especially a small sized town like Tallinn makes really sense to bike there. A cobblestone. We made but one of actually one of those small strategies we had we focused as an office and as a as a team very much on biking and every time pushed it into the media. So uh, Well so Ja, yeah. ah, please. Ja, yeah. yeah, Jürgen Breiter, Initiative Stadt Neudenken. Um, actually, I can understand what you are saying, but I think the main difference between these two projects is this is a small scale neighborhood project. And this is a project which is on a very high level about art industry, um, cultural industries, investment. And on this evening, there were some people presenting their official works um, and was a kind of um, presentation situation. And um, because there's still um, the open process and the decisions are not taken yet. So this was a very, very official evening and you can't compare it to a nice neighborhood event at all. So, um, But um, there were lots of people by bike, I can promise you. And uh, me personally, I belong to these crazy people carrying washing machines on transport bikes from Kreuzberg to Wedding. Um, and I'm, this is something and maybe nice to see. We are a very heterogeneous initiatives because I would say that the way of mobility is an expression of lifestyles. And this makes a difference, Matthew, for sure. Um, <laughs> and um, I think it's, it's really interesting to see um, how these symbols are used also. For, for example, when you think about living quality synthetics, then you have to think for um, alternative mobile, uh, mobility. mobility. Um, and this uh, is in, not possible to, to separate, actually. And um, I found it also really interesting to use this uh, alternative transport systems, for example, to occupy this uh, public space and to making this parking guerrilla event and, and something, um, I think, I don't know where they did start, but uh, I know it in different contexts is uh, where they did use It. And uh, I know that it's really dangerous because car drivers, they can become very aggressive when they're short on time and finding a parking place and then coming to these crazy people. But uh, I think it's a very strong sign and uh, to use also with bicycles as a symbol and an expression in public space to change the quality of, of this uh, public space. This, I think it's an important thing. Yeah, Jürgen, th thank you very much. And let me maybe add that it seems that the most important thing is the spirit about it, yes? And the, uh, if this is now a, a little or a big event, I, to, to my taste, I think it doesn't really matter because if the, if the spirit that's behind this activism, yes, is, is the one that's geared towards improving a situation, it doesn't matter if it's Blum Großmarkt or if it's uh, Selzimaya, uh, I, I just have the feeling it just needs the urge to really go into change, yes? Um, I think th there's also something that's worth worth adding to it is also like if like for instance initiative of Stadt Neudenken there's one guy who's not here right now but he's not in Berlin uh, Florian uh, Schmidt and a lot of uh, initiative of Stadt Neudenken lives from his tenacity uh, to to follow these political processes through the whole time and um, and I think that that's 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 one thing it's it's one thing to to just sort of like be um, be an activist and you know um, yeah come in uh, and so, sorry yeah. Matthew it's just like uh, so hello <laughs> hello Erko yes yeah guys take a place wherever you can sit you know we, 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 we're just kind of rounding it up yeah up uh, um, yeah. Well. Anyway. So, it's 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 really. I think the critical question is 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 how how do you how do you affect change? And whether we're talking about just painting something on the floor, or we're talking about you know a, a 15 or 20 million euro property deal, the question is is the aspect of trying to change the way things are done. And I think that uh, that's that's the thing is 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 you, you shouldn't. Uh, discount the people who drive the cars and you shouldn't discount the people who drive the bicycles. The problem is the people doing the 20 million euro deals discount the people who drive the bicycles and the people who are activists for bicycles discount the people who drive the cars. And it's only going to actually happen when we get together and talk about doing things differently if you can actually accept that other people are different. And, uh, yeah. Matthew, 
Thank you very much, because it seems like a nice word to move into the third third hype side, yeah, which means, um, since I think we're already, you know, running quite a while, uh, now there's, first of all, thank you very much for being here tonight, you know, being at the movie. Of course, you know, Jak will make a last remark, and I, th I might have an idea what it's connected to, but this Jak will do, of course. Yeah, we have a little uh, late, late shopping. But, um, and so, so let me maybe say, first of all, uh, we're going to be uh, downstairs again, and now with the little vodka, and I think also Erko and a couple of friends have arrived. So we will have just, just a nice time and stay downstairs where you have been before, now also with some... Um, Alcohol and some spirits, yes, speaking about spirits. Um, but, but, but first let me re really thank everybody who was here on the panel tonight. Uh, this is Regina, Taylor, Miku, Matthew, Jan and Jak for just coming here for two days and kind of bringing us all this information and I also hope taking something home. Yes, so thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. And so yeah, uh, I would like to. I would, just, I would like to use my uh, position as a producer. Uh, so if you uh, want to uh, spread the message of uh, the new world, so you can uh, give some <clears throat> small contribution, and you, you will uh, get the DVD of the film, and the money will uh, go to um, the party foundation for tonight. <laughs> So uh, there's uh, 10 DVDs available, available for you. Okay. And I would like to thank Christian, who invited us here and who provided us excellent excursion in Berlin and uh, who we will meet more and more times. I have a present to you. It's Urban Forum's book. It's um, in Estonian and in English. So everyone interested in about Estonian issues in urban development and stuff like that, you can... Um, Lend it from uh, Birch Stiftung Library, I hope. <laughs> and then there is uh, the Estonian Architecture Review Maya that Lina Labor High checks. So we, we made this uh, issue as well. So it will go to the library. And for tonight, I know this, is, this looks very German, yeah? <laughs> Some candy. Oh, shit. Okay. One Italian no, candies. Italian candy. so I, I, think you, I hope you will share them. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I would like to extend the thanks, of course, to Andrea Mesh, who has, uh, you know, organized the whole event. And, of course, to Falk over there, who did the technics. And now, please join us downstairs for a little drink. Thank you very much. Thank you.